Thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Renton. Okay, any questions? <laughs> he pretty much said uh, what I was going to say at uh, oh. the start. Uh, no, that's all right. I was going to start with the story of this little painting. Um, I'll, I'll back off and start with, um, he mentioned my mom. My mom is an artist. She um, was born in 1925, so you do the math. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, she's still active, driving, painting, loves to paint. I mean, the paints more than myself and Rick combined, I bet. But you know, he, he, she likes to just paint um, in a with a different focus. Uh, Rick and I are in love with the land. Uh, Rick more in love with the light and uh, the landscape. I'm in love with some places that I'm really intimate with. And that's my focus. And I don't paint for tourists or for the public. I paint for myself, my experience in a place. It's, it's my intimacy with the land that I depict. And uh, if people understand and love it, they, they can have it and have it in their homes. And if they don't, then, you know, I can't do anything about that. But uh, <laughs> so I was going to start from the beginning. I was born at a very young age. <laughs> and when I was little, I was a little Mexican boy. <laughs> no, I was born in, in Tulancingo, Hidalgo, which is about um, uh, roughly, it gets, keeps getting shorter because the roads are better, but about an hour and a half from Mexico City. And uh, if you were to be, you know, be at Mexico City and then my town is over here, and the famous Pyramid of the Sun is right smack in the middle. So in between that. So it um, just happens to be that in my little town of Tulancingo, just outside, there is a um, much older uh, set of ruins that people now get together to. Um, uh, it's a very powerful spot uh, in ancient disappeared civilization. And it's not Olmec. It's not. I don't know exactly what it is, uh, Totonaca, something like that. But um, I've been drawn to power spots all my life without knowing it. My um, uncle had a ranch near that, those ruins uh, called Caltengo. And uh, as a boy, I loved to play um, on the wall surrounding the actual ranch house, and there were these great big trees right next to the wall, and I had a favorite tree that I would climb, and just, I, I would love that place and spending time there, and uh, I didn't know what kind of tree it was, you know, so I moved away from Tulancingo when I was four, my mother and my father divorced at that time, and she moved us to Mexico City. My mom is a very powerful Mm, strong-willed woman, uh, always, uh, she, my, my dad was a, um, a veterinarian of ranch, you know, big animals, and uh, he had a pharmacy in town, and she ran it, and she was the brains of the outfit, and uh, uh, so when she divorced, she moved her family, which consisted of four of us, uh, I have a brother and two sisters, and went to Mexico City and started doing um, a lot of jobs, um, but her passion was painting, which she, she picked up months before I was born. Uh, uh, recently, she's told me stories. Uh, there was one that, I, and you know, I was afraid of this. I'm going to overshare, but uh, you know, it's 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 okay. You, I hope you appreciate it. Um, she would paint while my dad was away, and then she would hide her stuff under the bed, her, her, her materials. And then one time she was so involved in the painting, she kept painting. And my dad, and this is the reason why she divorced him, uh, used to drink and bring, bring friends who drank 
uh, once in a while to the house. And uh, so they came and she was painting and this other man told my dad, you better throw away those paints and paintings because this woman is going to leave you. And uh, you know, sure enough, uh, but it's an odd thing to seem to happen, but uh, she was definitely finding a passion away from him. <laughs> and uh, the first time I got in trouble is I went under the bed and I discovered this wonderful box of colors. You know, it's like, wow, this is great. And I opened it and, oh my God, I can do something with this. And I kind of messed around. I had a little card and I started painting it. And she came and she was furious because that was her passion, that was her thing, and nobody was supposed to get into it. And uh, to this day, we remember, it was like um, one of those moments where you lose, you know, like your, your belonging, you know, like she stepped on my car, like boom, like that, destroyed it, and I, it just kind of broke something, you know? It was like, uh, I'm not loved, <laughs> you know? But she loved me a lot, she played, with me, to this day, she says, you know, it was her favorite. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, so in, my, in my thinking of oversharing, um, I guess uh, there's been many uh, uh, father figures in my life, mentors. And I'm going to tell you about three, which I have their books here. And this is related to this, okay? So this man, Maynard Dixon Stewart, it was my um, art teacher in college, San Jose State University. And I studied, uh, he, he was a very good, excellent teacher. He studied with Frank Vincent Dumont at the uh, Art Students League, which is where my other mentor, Ray Strong, studied and studied with the same man. And that was uh, something that Ray Strong always appreciated about me, that we came exactly from the same line of teaching and learning about art. He said that we were on a line with Velazquez. Um, now Velazquez is gonna come up a little later in a song that I'm gonna do. Velazquez was that painter that painted the, the great painting Las Meninas that hangs in El Prado. And it's a big painting, big, big painting. And it's very famous, you know, the, the one where the painter is on the side and he's, he's painting a huge canvas Way in the back, there is this mirror, and in the mirror you see the king and the queen reflected. So the, he's painting them. And in the middle ground, there is this Las Meninas, is there the, the attendants of the little princess. And the princess is, is kind of, has a, a boy and he has his foot on a dog, like a, like a, it's kind of like a French, uh, what are those? No, the, the, those um, German shepherds. Big dog, beautiful head. Um, anyway, so this man is who got me into, uh, taught me to paint the figure. Now, he had a passion outside of figure painting, which was landscape painting. And he would take sabbaticals and go to Mexico and go to Utah and paint the landscape. So at the time, when I was you know, learning so much from him, I was just learning about uh, the figure. And, and uh, there are many things. This is like a, it's not a published book. It's a self-published book. But there are so many beautiful concepts here. And um, the main concept that he had was about seeing everything of a piece, not to look at different details and make them more important. but seeing the gestalt, the, the overall, the, the meshing in of the parts, making a beautiful, coherent uh, total. And uh, so that, that was something that stayed with me, and it, I think it's part of what um, inspires me or allows me to see hangings as a, as a whole. You know, uh, balance is very important. Composition is Primordial, you know, you can be a bad painter with good composition and and do beautiful work. What people will respond to, because um, in our world, in our world, every, you know how the um, 
the Greeks had this idea of the, all the numbers and uh, the, 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 the forms behind. So, and they found harmony and all of that. Well, it is true. It's all a lot of harmonies happening in, in your body, in the world. And uh, if you are in tune with that and respond to that, um, you're a long ways uh, to being an, an artist. And uh, gosh, I wish I had prepared this, written it down, but I, I, I didn't. Uh, I'm going to read you my artist statement and see if I can just take off from there, OK? This is my computer. This is uh, my website. Painting is a journey of discovery and adventure. It is an exploration of the spaces that surround us and our own interior. When painting in nature, you lose yourself. It is precisely in those moments that you are most present. So you lose yourself, but you're really there. At one with the world, I believe in the wisdom of uncertainty. I stand in, the fr in front of my easel with an honest inquiry. Why or how does this move me? The act of painting has less to do with hand-to-eye coordination than it does with heart and soul communion. A landscape painting is a celebration of beauty, a prayer of gratitude for open spaces, and the path to intimacy with nature. I see the role of the landscape painter not as a dreamer, but as an active defender of the land. Just as the farmer provides sustenance for the body, the landscape painter gathers food for the soul. Now, I use the word soul a lot, and it's not just to, for effect. You know, I really do believe that uh, the artist, through his soul, is with gratitude, uh, responding to creation. And I feel that people who have experienced that will respond to a true recording of that experience of the artist. And, and it is good for your soul. And um, Newly, I started saying uh, something that came up in a speech. Um, Choose a painting to match your soul, not your sofa. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, um, I suggested to Julie, and I think we're going to do this, that we should get a Polaroid camera. And when people come in, say, what's your favorite painting? And take a picture of them in front of it and give them the, the picture. And uh, yeah, you should really see if it resonates with you, with your experience. Um, when I was thinking about this talk, I, I, I was thinking that maybe it was, you know, whatever happens to me when I'm speaking, uh, you know, when I channel something, is, is an inspiration. And I thought, I'm not inspired right now. And uh, I don't know that I convey, I can convey a passion when I feel uh, a little blue, a little disconnected, you know, and, and that has to do a lot with what's going on politically and, uh, and the dragon drought. And, and um, the fires and the, uh, the mudslides affected me a lot psychologically. Uh, when I saw our mountains behind Carpinteria burning, you know, it was like the worst thing I could imagine that could happen. And then when I saw them just recently after the fire, you know, there was the white ash and the black uh, charcoal. And it was in such patterns that it created camouflage. And that camouflage hid the beauty of the light hitting the mountains. So uh, it was like beauty was destroyed. And it, it affected me. 
and I'm, I'm happy to be seeing it coming back. Uh, it's, um, I don't know how strong the ground cover is to you know, prevent uh, further tragedy, but it is beautiful. And uh, I've been hiking the mountains a lot and seeing uh, the wildflowers. And one beauty out there in nature has this power to, uh, to be reborn again. You know, that's also inside of us. And uh, it has happened many times that I feel a rebirth. And I'm kind of feeling it right now a little bit. Uh, because uh, you're, the way you're looking at me, I think you're uh, very special, beautiful people who are giving me all kinds of support through your eyes. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, what do I want to say? I guess I want to say, say way to my third um, mentor, father figure. And this man is um, Michael Whit, who's a poet and a, a, um, a doctor. And he was a very good friend of Ray Strong. And I met him some 25 years ago. I was a friend with Ray Strong for 26 years. I met him when I was 25, and he was 75. He died at 101. And uh, when he was 100 years old, uh, I made a speech at the Museum of Natural History. And I said, when I met Ray, he was three times as old as I was. And now he's twice as old as I am. <laughs> I was 50, and he was 100. And I said, I hope we both get, live long enough so that we end up the same age. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this man, this poet, talks about natural grace, which is what I feel sometimes, that uh, when you're down, when you're uh, not inspired, when, you're, when your world is a little grayer, and then something happens in nature, this, this grace of nature can revive the beauty in you and revive your, your, your gratitude for creation and the life force. And, um, this is a book of poems, of his poems. And at the end, without telling me, I mean, I think he asked, but he included a letter that I wrote to him. And he put it down as a poem. Though I didn't intend it as a poem, but, it not, but reading it, it is a poem. And it's called Generosity of Spirit. And <clears throat> it's for Michael Whit. And I, I, it relates to this, okay? I think of you on a hike in the cold, wanting to share a view, stopping to see a millipede and carefully removing it from the trail out of harm's way. I think of you sharing what you love on top of the mountain, in the wind, naming the landmarks, pointing to the distant peaks, the tiny flowers, the eagle, the line of a fence and of the wind sculpted vegetation. That's what we do as artists. It's like, look at that. Look at that beautiful, look at that beautiful uh, um, windrow of trees with the fog lifting and this great grass in front of it and the path leading. And, you know, we're telling you all this. Don't look at a painting like, a, you know, it just happened to be there. It's like, we're saying, wow, look at that. Check that out. We love it. I think of you in a parking lot, fixing binoculars on a mud puddle, peeping on swallows, marveling at mating and building rituals, passing the binoculars, sharing your excitement, quietly increasing my awareness and enriching my experience. I think of you pushing Ray's wheelchair up your front porch ramp, lovingly, Straining but not complaining. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. I think of you thinking, writing, speaking. Love the land. Love the creatures. Love each other. So I think that um, that's what um, life is about. And um, I have a friend, a good friend who's a poet, and comes by the gallery every um, Sunday to talk to me, and he talks to me about me. It's really weird. 
he says, he says, you got that Indian blood in you. He says, of anybody who I've ever heard speak, um, you know, it just comes through. You are not aware you're doing it. But he says, I've, I've read a lot and I've heard a lot and I, I collect quotations from the Native Americans because I admire them. And uh, you come through like that for me. And uh, I met him just when we were in the process of uh, helping the land trust to acquire that property. That property is now called Carpentria Bluff. Uh, no, it's called Rincon Bluffs, and it's at Carpentria Bluffs. And uh, we were doing, this was uh, 2016, and the land trust wanted to buy 21 acres, additional acres, that were just a little separate from the Carpentria Bluffs, which they acquired 20 years prior. And I was also part of that. So um, as soon as this was acquired, the first thing that uh, I thought we should do, and when I say I thought we should do, is I'm, I'm the president of Citizens for the Carpentria Bluffs. I have a couple of friends here who are also there. And um, the first thing was, let's do a cleanup. And uh, we organized this, this cleanup. People went there, and in a couple of hours, we removed two tons of trash from the place. And then, the, I believe it was the month after, we had a multi-religious uh, multi uh, blessing for the land. Uh, there's a correct word, which I'm missing right now. Uh, it's not just, yeah, interfaith, yeah, multi-faith, because it's not just Christian denominations. It's, it, we had a uh, rabbi, we had different denominations, and we tried to have a Chumash person, which we were unable to get that time. But uh, anyway, so they, they all spoke, and I said some few words of introduction, and this friend says, well, in your introduction, you said more to me about the the land, and what I said was, there is no, uh, I quoted Wendell Berry, there is no unsacred places, there's only sacred places and desecrated places. But my idea is that we, as people who care for the land, we have the power to consecrate a place. And uh, as a painter, I actually think that we're, in some ways we're, um, our painting on location is a type of ceremony of consecration. It's a prayer of gratitude for creation. And that's how I take it. I, I, I go out there, especially when I'm at the, at the bluffs, and I'm putting, you know, a bit of my gratitude and attention and experience and respect for the land. And you would not believe that those bluffs many, many years ago were used for people to dump stuff. And uh, at the, the very beginning of our first uh, acquisition of the bluffs, we did some cleanups. We, we did several pickup trucks, went over there to get stuff out of the ground and uh, you know to the dump. And uh, we had to do this by trespassing and not with permission. Uh, at the time, we didn't have a willing seller. Though he was a good man, he was wanting to develop his land. I'm talking about Ralph Brown. Now, he had a partner who was not a good man. <laughs> and uh, we had a big fight about that, um, about, about not developing the bluffs. Uh, I hope somebody writes a book about it some, someday, uh, because it was very interesting with, with, with last minute uh, you know, rushes to San Diego to stop the submittal of plans to the uh, uh, to the Coastal Commission. Yeah, it was pulled at the meeting by the new mayor, who was voted. Uh, three people um, got voted into office uh, to replace the old guard in Carpentria, and these three people, one of them is still in office, and this is, is like 27 years ago. And uh, they've given the town an incredible gift of their 
commitment and their time to uh, slow down the development that at the time was imminent. I mean, it was like a vote. I mean, it was not even a vote away. It was like it was a done deal. And uh, the town was very lucky that there, um, there was an awakening and a stop and a reverse and no, let's be a different kind of town. And, um, you know, I believe that, that time, at that time, that was a fight for the soul of Carpinteria and that uh, the soul is still there. You guys want to hear a song? Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to. I want to. I want to do three songs, if you indulge me. And the first one is my newest one, and I'm just going to do it by myself. I, I asked my friend Mark to help me in two others, and two others relate to Carpentria and the Bluffs, and to Ray Strong to painting. But this one talks about what's going on with me and why I'm not so gung-ho and passionate. It's, it's, this one is called Darkest Hours. And um, we have a book club. Uh, it, I don't know if I've told you, you don't know, that I run a gallery in Carpentria, the Palm Loft Gallery. And I'm, I'm glad that Julie is doing these talks because um, we need to have this uh, nexus of culture, you know, this part where we come and we're not in, totally in commerce. We are dealing with inspiration, with uh, creation, celebration, all of that. And so uh, I have a book club that we read books and write songs about the books. This song I'm going to uh, do for you is uh, inspired by a, a small book. It's called uh, Art and Ins uh, no. Poetry as Insurgent Art is Ferlinghetti, is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He, he co-founded the City Lights uh, bookstore and publishers in San Francisco. And that was the kind of place like, you, you know, like what I'm talking about. It's a resource for the community and for the uh, creative side of a community. And... Um, so in that book, he encourages people to speak up, speak to power, uh, have their voices heard. And it's a series of aphorisms and, uh, you know, one, light, one line uh, poems. But it's, it has a purpose, and the purpose is to speak up for, you know, how you think the world should be. And so... I took my guitar away, I'll be right back. Okay. It might be close enough, I don't know. New strings. The G is a little off, but I'm gonna leave it. And I, I don't wish to offend anybody's uh, political views, okay? This is just how I feel. From the fall of the Twin Towers to the fan of golden showers we're living our country's darkest hours a new terrorism of narcissism cynicism egoism Racism, nepotism, and attacks on journalism. A little black book of poems, press red squared hardcover, 
Bohemian and mother exhorting us to speak. And you patriotism of criticism aphorism activism altruism feminism a return to optimism from the boss of the Trump Tower to the fool with nuclear power we're risking our planet's darkest hour a new arrogation in immigration separation incarceration frustration consternation desecration of family relation now we need a ton of grace if we're going to replace this national disgrace and his entire base there's other things coming up that I, I wish I will I'll just stop here because I don't I don't I don't want to insult people directly <laughs> anyway I only included this because of um, it's the new one and because of the idea of a place to gather for culture like Ferengetti's um, Mark yeah my friend Mark Walker, he's another gallery guy. 10 West, uh, his gallery, he runs it with uh, his wife, Jan Ziegler. And uh, he's one of uh, the people who come to my song circles. And he is in the book club now. OK, I want to do one that is directly about painting and carpentry of bluffs. It's called, What Was That All About? And um, it's, it's a song that tells a story, but it also tells, it's from a perspective of a person who was in this um, songwriter's uh, retreat with me. And uh, what they asked us to do as an exercise is to bring a photo or a number of photos uh, and share them with somebody and tell them about the photo, about the picture. And then they would really pay attention and then mirror back to you, well, you were more passionate about this one. And this is what I saw, this is what I saw. So these words include his, his reaction to me and um, his reaction to the photo that I showed him. And so, Normally, I would not say these things directly because they're a little tiny bit arrogant. And though I, I know as a young man I was very arrogant, uh, I think I've left a lot of that behind and acquired through life a little bit more humbleness. But anyway, um, always, it always takes me a second to. Uh, to remember how it goes. What's that? The door? It's nice music.
In a folder of old clippings, I found a photograph of me as a young painter with a palette on my arm. The long black hair, the satisfied stare, match the great Velasquez I painted on my shirt. Behind me a huge easel I made of two by fours and a painting on the canvas Carpinteria Bloods It's about soul It's about freedom It's about love for a sacred land. We'll go back to that, so I hope you'll sing. I look like Che Guevara, or maybe Jesus Christ. And the easel in that context could be a gallows or a cross. Some thought I would be a martyr to a hopeless cause because I gave my heart in the face of certain loss but those clippings tell the story bulldozers never came and the bluffs will live forever and forever will remain a source of inspiration Cause it's about soul It's about freedom It's about love For a sacred land You wanna try it? It's about soul It's about freedom it's about love for a sacred land And that's what it's all about Thank you, Mark uh, Yeah, uh, do you guys want one more? Yes. Okay, so this one is called Where the Blue Begins <clears throat> and Where the Blue Begins is the title of one of Ray Strong's lectures on painting. And uh, Rick, where does the blue begin? <laughs> it's about atmosphere. I, I always thought Ray Strong spoke in poetry, so I couldn't really understand him. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess... Uh, I'll tell you here in the song, which is not about Ray Strong and about the, it just uses that, that title, which I love. Um, but this gives you the answer. <clears throat> There's an opportunity for you to sing here too. I heard it in a dream Can you tell me what it means? A whisper saying God is waiting Where the blue begins Can you tell me where? Just tell me where Can you tell me please? Where the blue begins This is the chorus Blue 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 Where the blue begins A voice said We'll never 
never mind religion Books of prayers or hymns Forget about communion And forgiveness of your sins God is right there waiting, waiting Where the blue begins And forget about Buddha Voodoo dolls and voodoo pins Forget all Hindu gods With their extra limbs And forget about Jesus And any other pseudonyms Go look for God Where the blue begins Blue, 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 where the blue begins. Thank you. Here's the answer. Some say it's in the distance where our vision cools and dims, but you can never reach it. As you approach it, it recedes. So it follows that the answer is somewhere deep within. It's always been inside you. Where the blue begins Blue 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 Where the blue begins Thank you Thank you, Mark just one second, she's going to dismiss us, but hold on. I, I, I know that I've been jumping and a little disjointed. I began to tell you about my poet friend who comes to the gallery and talks to me about me. And he, he gives me quotes, and he said one, one of the quotes was um, about uh, Gandhi. And I believe he was in some sort of um, um, silent retreat but reporters wanted to uh, run up to him and said, well, do um, you have a message for the people? Uh, you know, uh, we're going to write a story. And he wrote down, uh, my life is my message. And uh, this friend said to me, you know, like, and I thought about this when I was, what the heck do I tell somebody who wants to listen to me? And it's like, just that, you know, it's like, I, I, I have this love and this passion, both for painting and, uh, and the land. And um, just my life reflects it. And I guess that's it for now. <laughs> do we need uh, like a <clears throat> little break? What, Julie? So. Both Rick and I need to keep Julie happy. <laughs> <laughs> Speak up. Well, I don't mean for this to be over. I, I mean, let's go take a little break and then I'll answer questions. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. So anybody who's interested, I'm st I still have a mic, so we're going to finish the, the video. So I told you about the, that big tree in, the, in my uncle's ranch in Tulancingo. And so the, uh, the upshot is that I went back as a grown-up painter already who was in love with uh, Carpinteria Bluffs. I mean, passionately in love with the, the Bluffs. 
And I went <coughs> to visit the tree, and lo and behold, it was a eucalyptus tree. So I was like, oh, okay, that's where this come from. So, and I climbed that tree, and I found this uh, little painted heart on a piece of wood, and I took it as a souvenir, and now I have it. <laughs> who knows who put that there? I don't think I did. Anyway, um, does anybody have any questions? I sure appreciated your being here and your support with your eyes. Uh, I'm, I'm complete. If we, we, can, we can just be done and say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the idea. I, I, Rick Schloss did two uh, events in my gallery, um, and uh, he really explained his, uh, well, expressed his love for atmosphere and light and explained how it works in a very scientific way to artists, you know, what, uh, what is actually happening. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. So I, uh, I have this thing that it's occasional. It's not every month. But when I know that I have on the walls somebody who's interesting and uh, not afraid of speaking, because it's, it's really tough to find somebody who's not scared to death of talking, um, then I uh, do this event called 15 Minutes Max. And the idea is to mimic a little bit the format of TED Talks. It's like you only have 15 minutes, just pack it in and deliver, and you're done. And then I intersperse that with, you know, songwriters doing three songs, which is about 15 minutes. And uh, those events are really fun. And uh, we have a book here that, uh, if you want to put your email there, I include you in my email um, list and uh, tell you about those events. I'm very last minute, so you might hear about it. OK, it's tomorrow. But um, yeah, where the pen is, you can include it. It's a very fun thing, because it's a mix of things that people normally don't mix, you know? Yeah. Music and art. And I would go to an art opening, hear an artist talk, and then have music interspersed with it. That's very unique, very unique. I thought it was weird at first, but it turned out so great. Yeah, well, what it is, it's, um, you know, sharing creativity and it's inspiration that you take to your own life and apply it to your own, you know, passion. So it's, it all works. We're all one. Yeah. So, yes. So Larry likes to hear about composition. And uh, this composition actually is almost, it's perfect, but it's a, it's a forced composition because this is, this is bluffs three. This over here is bluffs one. And uh, in between, there's a section that there's a lot of buildings called bluffs, bluffs two. And if you can see, it's a little bit of a, a high vista looking down. Um, and what happens there, there's about mm, 20, 30 feet where there's a flat area here where people take off and their uh, hang lighters uh, do. And uh, so you go to this place that you can you know, find your way to. And in that corner is like the only place where you have a good view. So you're if you're an artist and you go looking, that's like the obvious spot to set up. And um, one thing interesting about this is that uh, I committed to uh, give a gift to um, major donors of the land trust who gave a good amount of money for the purchase of this. So I painted something like 20 paintings, that small ones, eight by tens, that were given to these people. And uh, so 
I, I know that this is in my heart, this, this uh, composition. I know it well. And uh, though I paint the bluffs over and over and over, it's never from the same spot. I'm always trying to find, uh, you know, like I said in my, in my statement, you know, I believe in uncertainty. I don't have a preconceived idea of what I want to paint. I want to go and see what stops me. And so it's not always the same, very same spot. Uh, Well, I didn't say it was perfect. <laughs> I did. No, I said. Uh, um, I think you said forced. Forced is like you have to. You, no, I said forced. Uh, well, what I like about it is uh, you always want to have a lead line. I mean, I, uh, this is below me, but it's a path that you know lets you know you're going to go in there. This curve, it's a very no kidding lead line, and all this. And uh, today I call this uh, Angels Over Rincon Bluffs, which is a made up title. I just made it up on the spot today. Uh, it was a wonderful day. I, w I went there. Um, Rick told you about my inventiveness with setups. So I have a big metal easel, it's, it's heavy. And so I'm able to do paintings this size on location. So I had big brushes, just boom, banged out those clouds and, um, you know, just, it happens to be a very uh, beautiful day and uh, that's what called me. Um, what else about the composition? Well, though this is not important, Casitas Pier, uh, it's there and it kind of leads you to it. Thank God that uh, oil is done in Carpinteria, so maybe that's going to return and be. It's owned by the community, it's not uh, owned by the oil company, so maybe it'll go back to being a, uh, you know, like a Stearns Wharf type thing or something. Just an enjoyment pier. I've said it so many times, I think, but. Uh, okay. You said, nobody complains if you make love to the same woman. And that's what this is like for you. That's back there when I was, uh, you know, arrogant and uh, whatever. Uh, I do remember saying that, and. Uh, I guess there's a different, uh, I, I, uh, I overcompensate. I don't want to be apologetic about always painting the same 57 acres. They're always different. They're always wonderful. They're, your love is there. So, I, you know, um, for some people, that is, it, it stops being art or stops being there's something wrong with you if you're doing that. You know, you're not pushing a boundary or you're not kind of, you know, like searching for something more. It's like, why do you have to, you know, if you're happy doing it? And if you, and one thing that I do do is that I don't have a formula for painting. I always throw a monkey wrench on my approach, on my technique. Uh, for the last two years, I've been painting in acrylic. This is an acrylic painting. That's an acrylic painting. And if you don't think that's a monkey wrench, you don't know how hard it is to paint acrylic to make it look like, you know, like uh, the stuff that would, would come out if you were painting oil. Uh, acrylics are kind of tough to control. I put oil on canvas on the tags. It's acrylic. <laughs> it's acrylic. We have a master of acrylics, uh, Marsha Burt good friend of ours, and uh, she can do it. A lot of people can't do it. It's tough. And uh, so that's my current monkey wrench, that I, don't, I can't just go there and say, oh, I'm just going to do it. You know, like, but some people have that idea that you can just close your eyes and, and do what you do, but you can't. You, you, you have to 
really not exactly know what you're doing. You have to be finding it. I, I mean, it, to, the, to the metaphor of the woman, you know, if you showed up to the same and, and said the same thing, give a line, you know, it's like they say, okay, I, don't, I, I, don't, I heard that. But if, if you're present and, you know, and your love is there, then it, it continues to be real. So that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I said I'm Rick Claus, and my wife and I run this gallery. That's my wife over there, Julie. And uh, her idea was to do every last Sunday of the month to do a little artist talk. Well, an opportunity for you, normal people, to just meet an artist and talk to them and ask them about how they work, whatever. Uh, so we started doing this. This is uh, our second one. We're lucky to have Arturo Teo here for this talk. Uh, Arturo, uh, I've known for a long, long time. In fact, uh, by way of introduction, I, I want to show you this little painting. <laughs> this is a painting of me that Arturo did in 1986. Oh, wow. And our, the very first Oak Group meeting, we met at Moon Point to paint and protect it. And I didn't know any of these people. Arturo knew a lot of them back then. But he did this painting of me, and I love the painting. I've had it forever. I love the painting because I recognize the bike, the colors exactly right. And the backpack that I made to carry my stuff, I remember that. The pencil box is exactly right. And I even remember that shirt. That I <laughs> um, so I love that. I love keeping the painting, and it's a bit of history, too. You know, because I heard a rumor that, I don't know if it's true, but a rumor that while he was painting this, Ray Strong was behind him painting Arturo. <laughs> uh, and that's true. We don't know. Do you know where that painting is? I've Actually, I do. Oh, you my storage. You have it. Oh, I don't, would love to see that. Don't do my talk. Just yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll talk. Well, no, yeah. That's, that's yours. Anyway, um, so I've known Arturo since 1986. I met him at this little paint out. And uh, I'm a kind of analytical guy, and that's something I liked about Arturo from the beginning, is he's kind of analytical. Like, back then, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a little push out box or whatever of painting easel and go out and paint. You had to make stuff because it wasn't available. And every time I saw him, he had a different setup that he had invented. He invented all these different things for holding paintings, for carrying them, for, you know, setting it up, uh, and I, and I love that because I kind of did the same thing, and uh, even today, Arturo's kind of an analytical guy because he's famous for hanging, he hangs a lot of the group shows in town, people always want him to hang their shows, uh, because he's really good at it, and, and I've learned a lot of, from him, because hanging a show is not just putting stuff on the wall, he's got a whole system. And, and he taught me distinctions about what goes on the right wall and what goes on the left wall and things like that. But he's got this system with tables and tape measures and spacers and it's all really elaborate. But when the show goes up on the wall, it's beautiful. You know, it's all perfect and you don't even notice that it's hung perfectly, but it is, you know, and it's beautiful. And it all comes from this system that I don't even understand the system, you know. Uh, but so he's kind of like that, uh, an unusual artist in that he's kind of analytical. But he's also done a lot of paintings like this of other artists painting and he's kind of famous for that. But he's also a very well-known fixture in the Santa Barbara area uh, in the art world and came from, well, I should let him talk, but uh, yeah. Yeah. his mother is an artist and she shows at the beach and he was a little late today because he had to help her set up her setup at the beach. And I think that's wonderful that his mother's setting at the beach. Anyway, uh, so without further ado, uh, you all know him, this is Arturo Tello. Um, we have some of his paintings on the wall and we have some very strong books uh, available. <coughs> and also, if you need the bathroom, just go through the curtain there, through the studio, there's a bathroom on the other side. All right. So.